holding this pistol. And then so we have the ceiling to come outside. Fuego, fuego, fuego. My name is Anastasia Benedict. I'm also from this institution outside. And we got a long time to the EMC program and the EMC coordinator. What he found me was that we took El Sabe to a house that was a supervisor. I'm kind of like stepping in and Somehow, this person that was supposed to present was in the same space. I'm stepping into that person. I am the um, inpatient coordinator for the San Francisco Health Class Alcohol and Clinical Dependency Program, um, known as Partridge House. And um, I am from the San Francisco Hawk Tribe, which is a very, which is a very intricate place where we stay, where we're located. We have, um, we consist of two countries, US and Canada, um, two counties, St. Lawrence and Franklin County. Um, it's, it's like a jurisdictional nightmare. Um, <laughs> we have two Canadian jurisdictions, which is Ontario and Quebec. We cross the border all the time. Our people have um, you know, daily, daily multiple they can, times. multiple times a day. We have um, access to Canada, and those cause barriers for our people. So, um, when it comes to programming, it's difficult. We are a federally recognized tribe. We are approximately 21 square miles of the reservation. Mohawk. Mohawk stands for people of the Flint and you'll get Hague. We are keepers of the Eastern Door. <laughs> we are one of originally five leagues, six, six nations now, including Seneca, Tuscarora. Oneida, Onondaga, Cayuga. Yeah. So um, we're known as uh, Haudenosaunee, which is also we're given a, a name by the French when settlers first came in of the Iroquois Confederacy. I think that's what most people know. Our um, Confederacy, yes, but we prefer the, to use the name Haudenosaunee. Here, um, the population that she talked about. We also um, have three different types of government because we are the border goes right through the middle of our community. <laughs> we have the yeah. yeah. Canada and the US, two provinces, um, two counties. Um, we also have three types of governments that we see our community. We have one on the Indian side known as Mont Hubs Sustain, so they kind of govern the Canadian portion of our reservation which um, there's a portion in Ontario and then there's two portions that are in Quebec, which would be, so this would be there. So this is the international line. So this is Canada, this is US, um, this portion is Ontario. And then these smaller portions over here is on the Canadian side. This is in New York state. We have uh, most of it's in Franklin County. However, we do have a small little portion in St. Lawrence County as well. So we have our Canadian government, which I just mentioned, and then we also have the San Francisco tribe, which is what we work for. Um, so they kind of oversee the um, American portion of our community. And then we also have our traditional government, which is the Mohawk Nation Council of Chiefs, which is our traditional um, chief and clan mother um, system as well. And they kind of oversee all of our situation. Um, on the traditional side of it. So we also have like three forms of government. And then also we have two different uh, local community police forces, one on the Canadian side, so they have different rules and jurisdiction. And then we have one on the American side, which has um, let's say Mohawk police, which is the Canadian side, and then the same response tribal police, which is the American side. And we also have like state police from New York State that kind of come through and handle certain areas because of um, we don't have our police forces don't have full powers in certain um, so yeah so when she talked about a jurisdiction like where it's literally one because we're dealing with several governments several countries 
several different types of jurisdiction on depending on what's happening. So some of our programs are duplicators. So there are some programming that's similar on the Canadian side and the American side, but we all try to work together to make sure we can provide the best um, services to our community and its members. Um, so we're just going to talk a little bit about what we do with our programming here. Um, so we, for with the alcohol chemical dependency program, uh, we have four components, which I'll let Crystal kind of give you a little overview of what services we provide to you. So as you can see, we have four components. Um, we have, we do promotions through media, um, radio, billboards, for prevention, prevention for the continuum of care. We have a prevention um, component and the team goes into the schools and they work with the youth and they work with the community and they do all kinds of community events. And that, that helps to bring people together. It helps to bring awareness. Um, for the protective factors to assist with the risks of um, promoting risks against drugs and alcohol. They promote healthy lifestyles within the community. They also have the inflation, which is the inflation cartridge house. The cartridge house is sense for federally recognized study. It's from a federally recognized by all patient service. Work together, all four components work together, and then we have the club calls for the youth. And they all work, they all work together. It's a continuum of care for treatment and recovery. Okay, so I'm going to talk about volunteer well, dog that used to be house. Um, so we first opened on July 1st, 2018. Um, we are located um, within our Diabetes Center for Excellence building, we have, um, which is also in the middle of our Generations Park, which is a great park. There's a walk trail, there's some crosswalks, there's different areas that a lot of people utilize, which we think is a great location um, for our clubhouse as we serve ages 15 to 20 um, from up to Zesne. So a lot of times they're going to the park to either um, you know, basketball courts, crosswalks, walking trail different things for them utilized. So it's kind of like great that they're like right there and we're kind of right there for um, serve them as well. Uh, next slide. So the public commission is a to welcome to young adults to develop those social skills that promote long-term health, wellness, recovery, and drug and alcohol for style. Um, so that's kind of like our mission and what we're hoping to um, across with our some of the goals that we have at the clubhouse is um, skill building, um, increasing self-esteem and self-worth, um, having them develop a sense of responsibility to not only themselves but also the community. Um, we're also there to help them encourage positive family relationships, peer and community involvement, and to help them maintain an ultimate drug-free lifestyle or strengthen those that are already in recovery. Um, and to put, we also provide, which we feel is crucial, is our cultural center activities and education to promote self awareness and strengthen their own identities. Um, put a lot of stress on connecting everything to our culture and our community because we feel like that would um, feel like they can connect to their culture and get back to their roots. It will help them make better choices in life and become better. Life. Um, so I'm just going to talk about some of our activities and different things that we, we do at the clubhouse. Um, so we do offer some tutoring, um, peer youth support groups. We have a lot of like um, youth meetings that we host at the clubhouse, not only with our program, but also other community programs as well. Um, we provide cultural education along with um, craft workshops, um, traditional medicine workshops. Um, we also encourage fitness and health education. Um, healthy foods, um, nutrition, traditional food workshops. Um, we also make sure we're incorporating job health, tobacco education, and whatever the current trends are. We always try to incorporate 
well. Um, everything to encourage a healthy lifestyle. And we can also make referrals to health and wellness for the programs that there's a need between the youth that are um, attending the water round. Um, so one of the um, one of some of the um, activities we provide is related to um, learning our language. Um, we want to make sure our youth are um, learning the language to help promote and keep it going over the next seven generations. So we offered one of the first classes we offered was we had a local. Um, well, she was like in her early 20s, um, but she went back and took some language programs and she's trying to learn the language herself. So we brought her in to kind of like, um, we brought some of our participants in and everyone was usually given a traditional Mohawk name when they're little, when they're born. Um, so she had them bring their names and she broke it down for everyone to really let them understand what their name really meant to them um, and how it is. So this was an example of what each of our um, new participants that came in, they all received this with their own name on it and how to like um, pronounce it phonetically and how it's all broken down to give the literal translation because in most languages, things don't translate the same as in English. And a lot of times, some of our words are really hard to describe or translate into English. They're more descriptive. Our language is really more descriptive. Um, so we also had our help us pick out a name for the clubhouse. So this is our clubhouse name, it's Spocket. Um, and it means place where they're making their road nice or good, so, or path. So we like to say where they're making their path good. This kind of a loose translation, because like a lot of our words aren't specific, because um, they came before English, so. So yeah, so that was one of them. Uh, the youth that participated really loved it. They loved learning about their name and how it came about, and then the breakdown of like each section of their name, what it really means. So. That went over really well, and we're always trying to promote language in our a lot of things that we do as well. Um, so I'll go over some of the um, different types of activities we host. So one was corn style making. Um, so with all of our activities, we try to use um, those from our community that have the best knowledge or best skill craft for whatever we're trying to like promote. Um, so we brought in a local crafter that knew how to make corn husk dolls. So a lot of our example at the bottom of what they look like, it has no face on them. Um, so it was taught by an elder in our community. And, and every time they, they come in, they always explain like why we're, why this craft is made or why we're making them and the history behind it. So how it originated from way back hundreds of years ago and how it's changed over time and using like different resources or technology and how it kind of changes some of our crafts um, and then how we're making it today. And then they also had the opportunity to like make little outfits for them and dress them. And then there's an example of um, the ones that came in of some of what they made. So they really go about the whole history, um, really talking about it and how it's changed over time. Um, so another um, series that we started was traditional teachings and singings. Um, so we collab with our traditional medicine um, program, with, which is part of our health services. And we had him come in to really teach youth that want to learn more about um, ceremonies for different aspects in our culture, along with learning some songs and how to use our like, water drum and the rattles and learn different songs and stuff. Um, and kind of like um, we center it around whatever's happening that time of year. So whatever the upcoming ceremony is coming up for that year, um, it's kind of what they'll talk about, like why the ceremony is done, how it's done, um, how it's important, and kind of like break it down for those that maybe um, want to go to the ceremonies that haven't been before, or those that may be gone, but because everything is in our Mohawk language at ceremonies, Sometimes you don't get the interpretation from it. Um, so a lot of people attend, but they don't really understand what they're saying. So it really breaks it down so they have a complete understanding of everything that's happening. Um, so we would bring him in just to teach that and also have a like a safe, like comfortable space where they feel free to ask questions. Because sometimes when you're around like adults or a lot of people um, kind of get a little young person or even as some adults get nervous to ask certain questions and this is kind of a safe safe space to really ask those questions. 
Um, so this is another example. So more rattle making. So we brought in a local person that um, makes more rattles, and this is what we use for um, part of our um, they learn songs and singing, drumming and rattles as well. So they all got to learn how to make the rattle, why we use it, again, with everything we incorporate the education behind it. Um, so this is um, the baskets. We have um, our community is known a lot with basket making. We have a lot of basket makers who actually have basket sets so, like, even all over the world. Like there's some amazing basket makers from our community. Um, so we like to bring them in. Uh, some of them that are still um, around to bring them in to teach that craft. So, um, so some of the different types of um, swim crafts or basket making with them backpack baskets so like these little ones um we also there are some are made a lot bigger than that but because of the time frame and and they're new at making it so we just had to make them new ones um from like little mini baskets at the top to um splint flowers which are in the middle and then we've also done splint belt ornaments which is on the far side so little ornaments um, that they can have and then like snowflakes Place and bookmarks as well. So we try to utilize um, a lot of our resources from our local area and just really teach the youth so they can continue these um, Back to our roots garden project. So we wanted to um, also incorporate like sustainability and help lifestyle and also um, talk about how important is garden to our community and, and to members well and also maybe to also dealing with different stressors and it's a way to like de-stress and how it how be like a full balance kind of aspect. Um, so uh, in the beginning we started with these little um, at the clubhouse in front these little planters and they came and they planted um, and then they kind of like help maintain the little little plant in the garden like throughout the season and then they got to harvest it and then had like a meal with what they um, harvested. Um, and then COVID came, kind of threw a wrench into everything. Um, so we decided that we would do um, a remote version of this. So we were able to have some local crafters build us some garden beds. Um, and we just had them curbside pick up. They we bought some soil, some seeds, some like packet of information that we felt they would um, need. And they took it home and worked on it themselves. And then they sent us pictures. So this is some of the pictures of some of our youth gardens. Um, send us pictures on their progress throughout the, the thing and uh, throughout the garden project. And then uh, we got to get some feedback from them and everyone loved it. Like it was great and beautiful. And then we, um, we end up turning this into um, um, expanding the project a little more which I think we'll talk about in the next slide. Um, is the Dada News Series. So an all language Dada News Calendar. Um, so it could be a uh, credit parent, it could be an auntie, an uncle, or it could be just um, an elder in the community. So I had this idea when I was working at the clubhouse to, to reconnect our youth with an elder. So in a lot of our culture and a lot of Native communities, Elders are the ones that are passing on our tradition, that are doing a lot of teachings. And they're also, because of the, the issues we're having in a lot of our native communities, and they're also the ones that are sometimes raising our whether it's um, the parents have to work, so they're spending a lot of time with their grandparents or an elder or an auntie or an uncle, um, or because the parents are just not able to be there to raise their children, that sometimes the, parents, the grandparents are actually raising the grandkids. Um, so I wanted to reconnect, rebuild that connection between elder and youth in several aspects. So one of that is um, to also have that person be a trusted adult. So if the youth is going through any issues or any problems, they have that person they can connect to that they feel comfortable with going to them and saying, I need help, or this is what's going on, I'm feeling sad or depressed or suicidal, or no, I'm like 
using substances and I don't know what to do, can you help? So we wanted to build that connection to if they have another trusted adult they can go to. Um, the other part of that is we also wanted to provide um, elders with education. So a lot of time elders don't really know what to do or where to go for services in the community. So we so during all of our activities that we did with them, we provided the elders with education on different programs that we have in the community, who to call, different resources, what to do. We did like even current trends and drugs that's happening in our community, like what to see, what to look out for. Um, all of that. So we wanted to provide the elders with education so they can help the youth if they're in need. Um, so it's kind of was like multi-factored idea I had in my, in my mind, so we came up with a good idea. So it's with an elder and a youth, and they would come in and we just did different craft projects or different things, and we would do some examples that they did. So these looked like this was medicine coach making. We did a flower arrangement class, which they all love, so they all got to make their own flower arrangements. Um, we did that like kind of around Mother's Day in May. Um, they did turtle shell um, pouches as well, and we did um, um, salve making, so different traditional using like um, different medicines you can find outdoors and what you can turn them into. So we did a salve making class, so we had an elder come in and teach that as well, but they got to do it with um, a good outcome choice. So, um, so we kind of like, and then that's how we shifted our back to our roots garden project is the last two years, we've actually made it a data and me. So they're working on their garden projects now with an elder and me. So also, also those that connection. Are the elders family members or the um, Most of them are family members, but they don't have to be. It could be just an elder that's in the community, maybe that they're close with a neighbor or um, like a family member's friend, but yeah, it can be anyone. Um, so we also wanted to um, teach our youth about some of our traditional foods and cooking parts of it. We use a lot of this during ceremonies as well. Um, so we started a cooking traditional cooking series. Um, so far, we've had them um, learn how to make our traditional corn soup, corn bread, corn mush. A lot of these are used at certain ceremonies. They're kind of like um, the classes around those times, so they kind of understand that. Ceremony as well. um, but they're also really good. <laughs> they can also make it at home as well. So next slide. So a lot of other crafts we do we do a lot throughout the year. And of course, when we're doing a craft, we also have snacks and food because it's got to be things that are going to be there. Um, so some of the other crafts that you can see up there, so leather mittens, which is on the far end over there, um, leather moccasins, we did that. So Actually, in May of this year, we had some of our high school students come in and they made their own leather moccasins, their own leather skirts, um, and then, not leather skirts, but traditional ribbon skirts, sorry. So leather moccasins, they made traditional ribbon skirts, and then we did some well, of the men made best and that they're able to wear at the graduation. Um, we also did, um, we, most recently, last week, actually, they learned how to do their own fake pottery. So they actually did the fire outside, outdoors, using the resources they have outdoors. Um, so they had a couple classes with that. They all loved it. Like, that one was really fun. Um, we also did some feed work. Um, and then in the middle is some samples of some of the foods. With, they made one made a heart out of the cornbread that she made. Next slide. So yeah, so that's <laughs> everything on the clubhouse um, that we do for um, ages 15 to 20 within our community. So we take over our education program. So you're probably wondering why all these activities, it's to reconnect everyone back to our original group. Partridge House's mission and purpose is to provide a healthy, caring, safe environment for Native Americans. Men and women who suffer from alcohol and drug addiction, and it's a true self empowerment and um, traditional teaching, and utilizing a non judgmental team approach. To provide a journey of hope, healing, wellness, where holistic and spiritually focused and trauma informed. 
We are licensed by the New York State Office of Alcohol and Substance Abuse Services, which is OASIS, um, and I say which is Mohawk Tribal Health Services, IHS Division. Um, Trauma-informed trauma approach in our setting is to, to utilize um, an understanding that we've all, all the people that come through treatment have had traumas and we utilize an approach of understanding and acknowledgement and we meet them where they're at. We provide that safe and trustworthy space, you know, and um, we use um, a lot of, a lot of uh, treatment approaches because of the impacts of trauma that people have experienced. And um, of course, the client that goes through inpatient services, they're the expert on their trauma. So, you know, we have to leave them away. Partridge House is a 16 bed. So, Partridge House is a 16 bed um, facility. It started in the 1980s. And the, and then it grew. And then they had, um, it, I believe it was only 10 people at that time. And it was just men. And then they brought in um, another trailer to make women, you know, availability for women. And then they built a building. And that was for 10. And they only serviced so many men and so many women. We added on in 2000. And now we are in a 16-bed facility. Um, we are a 12-step based program. And uh, we do counseling, group therapy, educational lectures. We incorporate uh, the traditional teachings in everyday programming. Um, the people that come through um, treatment can experience sweat lodge ceremony. They can go to ceremonies. Um, moon ceremonies. It's about reconnecting back to our roots, right? Um, so there are certain requirements to come into treatment. I'm sorry, the screen is moving on its own. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there are, there are certain requirements to get into treatment, and one of them is to be a federally recognized member of the new tribe in the United States. Um, we follow the DSM-5 criteria for substance use disorders. And um, of course, we have agreements with other tribes, whether it be purchase orders or, you know, for CHS payments or private insurance. Um, the other day in the programming, and this, we've done this for a very long time, so every day, the, the clients will get up and they'll part of their opening and is to do the opening address, which is a Thanksgiving address every day. It's called the Pohonga Thalia Deco, which is words that come before all else. So, and they do it in Moa. Um, whether they're from our reserve or not, we have incorporated it into. Um, I guess phonetically, we broke it down so they could read it, you know, so anybody could read it. And we read right from the people to Mother Earth, all of creation. These are what we do. This is, this is what we do when we give thanks. We do this all the time. So we do it first thing in the morning. And sometimes they can choose to do it at night too. Um, this is a very important part of our our culture because it's they do that at every ceremony. Next slide. So at the end of the day, they do the closing prayer. And this is the overt spirit prayer. And this is not done in Mohawk. They just do this and say the prayer and it's done every night. And most of the people that I've worked with have never I guess you would say because of the traumas and the historical factors implementing in their lives, they haven't experienced prayer. 
don't like the word prayer, but it's just um, closing. It's like to close out the day, to end your day. It's a way of telling creator, you know, this is who I am today to help you to be a better person tomorrow, you know? Next slide. So during our programming, we incorporate yoga and meditation. And <clears throat> it, it helps with mental, emotional, spiritual, and physical. Um, the mindfulness and open-mindedness for positive thoughts of the day. Um, emotional promotes balance of emotions for a better train of thought. Thank you. Spiritual and home space with a self physical health as well. So here are some pictures of, and of course I have to because of the anonymity, I have to block out some faces. Um, this is in our group rooms because the weather wasn't so great <laughs> and we were going to get it inside. Um, they're doing guided meditation. And there's some yoga there going on. Um, and when they when we present to the any new client who wants to treat and then we tell them that they'll be part of yoga and meditation, they're like, oh, why? But it's all part of feeling good about stuff, right? So um, once they do it, they really love it. Right. So we have cultural instructors that come in to educate the clients on the history and tradition of the Mohawk people. Not everybody that comes through treatment knows the history. They've been disconnected because of the drugs and alcohol. And a lot of times they want to come to treatment at a cartridge house to learn and feel a part of once again because they've become disconnected. So um, it helps with reconnecting, connecting to their roots. Um, some of them have never had teachings, you know, because of the, the traumas, the, the generational traumas of, you know, residential schools and stuff. So we help them to reconnect by giving some of, giving them the opportunity of, of experiencing some of the cultural practices and the treatment. Um, so quite have, they, they participate in activities as well. We've just started doing this, um, like within the past year of uh, having instructors come in to teach rattle making, drum making, fan making, ribbon shirts, ribbon skirts, baskets, and medicine pouches. And along with that, they learn the history of where that comes from and why we use it. It also gives them a sense of pride. It builds their self-esteem um, because any person that comes in treatment has no self-esteem. You know, they're really feeling like they can't do this. And then with the, with the finished products that they have, that they complete, we, they really feel good about themselves. And this that's important. That's important to engage them in treatment, keep them engaged. Plants take these teachings with them. And like I said, they make baskets. They put all their tools in them. That's the tools they need in the they can take these things home with them and they can say, I made this in treatment. You know? and, and I showed some of the pictures to some of, some of the people that so and so made this. No. <laughs> it was hard to believe, you know, because, because there's that stigma out there. Let's, let's get that out there. There's a stigma out there that you can't do that, you know, but they did. Next slide. So our curriculum runs over a course of eight weeks. Some people are there for 10. 
going to go for seven. You know, it's all individualized treatment. During that time, the activities are also, are based on an eight week. So it takes two classes to make a style basket. It takes one class of these medicine pouches, two classes for the ribbon skirt or the ribbon shirt, which is really a tight class because there's a lot of work in to go into a ribbon skirt and ribbon shirt. Um, the fan, fan, drum, and rattle are all one class. And the products also take part in medicine walks and they keep, they do that in the early spring and in the summer. Because there's only certain times that you can take medicine. That's, so here we, sh we have um, garden beds, which they also take part in. These are the vegetables that they grow in the garden beds. Those are tobacco plants, which is um, what they're going to work with um, drying and, and they'll have tobacco to put in their medicine pouches. So um, those are the different style of med medicine pouches that they have made. There are pictures of um, the pouches that were made by the client. They're used to carry the medicines such as sage, cedar. That they did use for smudging, which they also do every day, throughout the day, all day long, just okay. they smudge and to clear the negative energy, bring positive. Um, cedar is used to make tea, used in sweat lodge to drink the wash down for cleansing. Tobacco is the medicine that is burned for ceremony. Next slide. So here you see we had a rip, um, a class for the ribbon shirts and ribbon shirts, but this class was all men, the first one. So um, this is this is the product we finished at at the beginning of the class. I mean at the end of the first class, that's what he had done. Cut, cut his shirt out, um, and then he had to sew it. We have sewing machines for them to use. We have everything. We don't have um, sewing so gives them a sense of pride, social connectedness, which is very important because people that have come to treatment are used to being isolated. So this gives them a social, you know, social gathering, and it, it's calming and and um, it teaches them patience, to socialize in a healthy way. This is the basket making class. Um, the instructor does the history on the pounding of the logs, right to um, how the squirts are made. And he incorporates all this um, into his instruction of how to do the baskets. Um, I said the baskets are used to carry the items they need to for ceremony, but they can also put all their stuff that they made. For all their activities. These are pictures of um, the items that they made. There's the fans they have made, the rattles, and the hand drums. Um, they're, you know, when they finish a class, they're so proud, you know, and it's great to see people empowered so much by doing these cultural activities um, that they never believed in themselves that they could do it which makes it very important for them to take part in. Um, so this next, the new series of um, ribbon skirts and, and stuff, we had some females come in. And I do have a picture. She did finish it right before I came, but I don't have a picture on here. But this, this material she made a ribbon skirt with. I have some females in treatment now. Um, these are some of the other products that they had made. They had made some jewelry, beading, um, another pouch, a big medicine pouch that, that was made. But like I said, you know, when they come together in that room to do these activities, they feel empowered, they feel part of, and they're, they're socially engaging. They're not talking about their war stories um, in addiction. You know? They are all one there united. 
and they work together, which is a great, which is what we need them to do. And they feel good about themselves, and that's what we want. We want them to feel good about themselves. Okay. And that's all I have. So um, we share our information about our programs and upcoming activities on our social media pages. So um, our health and clinics program has a Facebook page. Um, and then our prevention and proposal chats are on Instagram pages. And Sarah 25 also has a Facebook and Instagram page as well. And we also share with our local radio station, which is Bright uh, Smart Communities in Carolina. And we also have a um, kids also live in our community called our present. And they promote a lot of our program as well. They also promote a lot of our activities or stuff that we can have in the community. Um, so most recently, we were part of um, our Carolina Coalition at home and put on a uh, color bubble run this year a few weeks ago. So they came out and did a great segment on that whole. Um, community activity that helps promote alcohol drug free activities that our families can come in and participate in as well. Um, we try to do a lot of promotions and advertising for a lot of our activities. So that's all we have. No, thank you. We did have, we used to have, or it's a youth home. Well, it's not a, a recovery. So we used to have a youth recovery treatment center, which is on the green portion of our local yeah. area, but it closed down not too long ago. And we have, um, we do have a youth home, but it's more for adolescents and behavioral issues. Um, but we refer out. So we had youth that are in the city. We have other things so, um, within like local um, town near us and stuff that we can refer and get them from. We also, some of our adults, depending on their, their needs, um, we also do make referrals. So, say, for instance, we can be the appropriate place for them, whatever their needs are in treatment, we can refer out as well. But we can see Do you ever send any of your youth to uh, Unity? We oh, used to. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we used to send a um, majority of all our youth. We actually did send to Unity yeah, years ago. But I think we kind of utilize, um, can you still send them back? No, no, I didn't. Um, so. We've tried to. However, um, we ran into some complications about trying to get the youth down there. So there is a non-native facility in the local town that we send to white people. So, mm -hmm. I think Unity was closed for quite some time. But we used to um, do the assessment on our youth and we used to like um, meet them. So one of our concerts is actually to travel with them right. to get them situated and then also travel back down to the I don't have a question, but I have a question. I'm just um, delighted to see you working with you. It's critically important. You know, if we're, if we're going to do anything about the epidemic of substance use disorder that we are suffering from, you really need to have it stop thinking of people, you know. And the only way I know to do that is to somehow get young people to just never have to try it. Because there are, I'm convinced that there are some people that the very first time mm -hmm. if they ever try something, they're hooked. That's not everybody, but there are some people that are just unfortunately that's the way to wire that. Um, the other comment I have is that I've worked at Eastern Bank in Cherokee for two decades. And over the years, I've known quite a few people who went to Partridge House uh, from Cherokee. And I've never heard anything but good about that experience. So just wanted to give you that feedback. Uh, I think everybody who's been there had a very positive experience. Very nice. Um, 
yeah, we feel like getting back to um, getting our youth educated. So with our prevention program, we are also in the school, right? As first grade kindergarten, we're doing curriculum in the school with them about prevent. Yeah, we're doing everything we can in our community. I have a question. So the type of test, is it um what is like the detox process? Do you have the detox? So so oh. currently we, we do have a new detox service on the Canadian portion of the health assessment. However, that's one of our barriers that we're just figuring out how we're gonna get a person from Canadian detox into our program. However, I do utilize um other detox services, person must be assessed prior to admission, whether it be through their hometown services or make an appointment with our outpatient services. Um, detox is recommended and we utilize the Mental Crisis Center and we we'll utilize the, um, the Messina Hospital Detox. Yeah. I have a question um, for those of us who live in communities or areas where recreational drugs are now legal um, how is your community especially with considering all of the different jurisdictions um, and the laws that have recently changed in New York, how are you all um, tackling that? And how are you working um, in the community to kind of overcome the, the normalcy around recreational drug use? Well, um, whether it be legal or not, it's still a drug and it's still a drug. So our prevention services are out there making our community aware of, you know, the risks of addiction. Um, we don't like to say we condone it. We don't condone it. There is a lot of dispensaries on our reserve. Um, we were talking about how many? 40 portion with the U.S. side. And there's 32, I believe, documented on the Canadian side that would include Ontario, Ontario, yes. and yeah. 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 so, so I mean, cigarettes are are legal, alcohol is legal. So now they're saying marijuana, cannabis is legal, but they're still all addictive products, right? So we have to treat it the same way. We have. Oh, sorry. Wendy. Oh, Wendy. Wendy's our case manager for. <laughs> Outpatient services. <laughs> um, one of the things with that question is we have been able to get into some of the dispensaries to offer Narcan um, simply because some of our dispens or some of the dispensaries are tribally recognized and some are not licensed, like licensed, licensed, licensed. Yeah. So if they're not tribally licensed, it's kind of a free spot. There are many, majority are not. Very few are Yes. Any questions? For Narcan, the health insurance companies are paying this for the business tax. The Narcan, does that have any effect on um, tennis over? What is processing? It is. It's being laced a lot. No, so okay. if it's being laced, it makes the um, marijuana more addictive. Therefore, a lot of the dispensaries is showing people that they're making the effort. No, it's fentanyl and there's a new one now. that, you know, people are like, oh, well, it's not addictive, but they're like different things and they just keep coming, different additives. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, Narcan is uh, very important and it, it's um, given throughout inpatient treatment. If 
a person comes through and we've already done the Narcan treatment, then we'll send them to one of Lindy's pop-up treatments. You know, um, she does them all the time. You know, we Narcan is easily available for our community. She's doing one tomorrow. <laughs> Just making that plug. Yes. I'm going to help you. We also can give our clients um, fentanyl strips to test if their drug has fentanyl in it. So when they come in like out, outpatient, we have to give them those strips. You know, I let them know that we have to run some of these tests to see if we can test fentanyl. Okay, That's those, are, those will be in. Those will be in Lindy's presentation tomorrow as well. Yeah. So come to the session tomorrow. You will get a kit with all of the stuff in there. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.